Hello, I believe I'm live. My uh, laptop in front of me says I'm live. So I send warm greetings, a big hello to everybody who has tuned in. To my friends in New Zealand and any fellow Kiwis living anywhere in the world listening to me. Kia ora. I'm Heather Morris, the author of The Tattooist of Auschwitz and Silka's Journey. And another one coming out in a few months time which I'll talk about at a later date. But for now I just want to send greetings to everybody. I want to acknowledge all of us who are in lockdown, quarantine, whatever word you want to use. What a Mother's Day it was yesterday for us all. Yeah, well thankfully Zoom, Facebook, I was able to check in on my family, my little grandchildren and say hello. So I hope that all you mums out there got to do the same. But I'm here to talk to you a little bit about, well, me, I guess, and, uh, and my stories. I thought I'd start today by talking to you about a little town called Krompaki. Now Krompaki is this beautiful little village at the base of the Tathra Mountains in Slovakia. Scenic with the babbling brook running through it. I think it's got a population of about 7,000 people. But back in 1942, Lully was there. He was living there with his family. He was born there. I've actually even seen his birth registration, uh, the document in this huge, big, beautiful journal that the mayor of Krompaki showed me. Now Krompaki was the base for Lully becoming the man that he was. And the subsequent man who got to tell me his story. If you see behind me, I think you can just see a little bit. I'll adjust my computer a little bit. There's a shape of a bell on my wall that was given to me by the people in Krompaki. A uh, nice place to visit. I thoroughly recommend anyone going there. But what I'm most proud of with relationship to Krompaki and my connection to it is that there now exists there a Holocaust memorial. Thanks to the mayor and the people in that town, a section of land, a block of land, was donated to become a Holocaust memorial. And I had a bit of a role in uh, having this made. It's been turned into a garden, a beautiful garden, and the centerpiece is a huge big garden in the shape of the Star of David. There's a memorial rising from the center of that star. It's a plinth, a marble plinth. And from that, two arms carved out of two logs of wood rise to the heavens. It's the inverted picture from my book and with the numbers of Lali and Gita um, burnt into it. So I'm citing you in Krompaki because that's where my story started. And I hope to put up, after I've finished chatting to you tonight, a photo of that memorial. I believe there's only one other Holocaust memorial in Slovakia and that is in Bratislava, which I have seen. From Krompaki, Lully found himself in Auschwitz. From Auschwitz, he made his way back to Slovakia. From Slovakia, he escaped with Gita and found their way to Vienna, to Prague, and then finally to, no, not Prague, sorry, it was Paris. It was Paris, because he loved to talk to me about his time in Paris, where he saw the amazing um, American entertainer, Josephine Baker. He used to describe her to me. And you've got to remember, he saw her 60 odd years ago and he still remembered and he would stand up if he was sitting down and he would hold his hand up around his mid chest and say she had legs that came up to here. He was pretty impressed with Josephine Baker and you know, why wouldn't he be? Lully and I met in 2003. Now I have some questions from some uh, people, some readers and some people who have connected to the this chat that I'm having and I'll try and answer them in amongst my talk to you and if I don't cover anything in particular I'll go back specifically and deal with that. Look thank you very much to Melody. Uh, thank you for your comments about uh, enjoying my stories. Thank you, I do appreciate it. And you ask am I planning on writing another story? Well the short answer is yes. It's a story, it's a book coming out in September, October this year, quite different to anything I've written before. It's non-fiction. Now that's a change, isn't it? It's called Stories of Hope. 
And if you want to find out a little bit more about it, you can go to a website, www.yourstoriesofhope.com because on this website and in my book, I'm sharing your stories. The stories that have come to me from so many people all around the world who tell me that they have taken hope from reading about Lali and Gita and Silka. And it just became the natural progression of my writing that I needed to tell as many people who want to read it about these amazing emails and messages I've received. Because from them, I've been given hope. I certainly have been inspired to keep writing. And I've been inspired to not only write, but to look at all aspects of my life and say, well, how can I be a better person when all these amazing, wonderful people have found the courage, made themselves vulnerable and opened up to me, a perfect stranger. And I appreciate that. So I'm going to give back. And so Melody, stories of hope coming your way. But I've just digressed a little bit, haven't I? Because I really wanted to talk more about Lali tonight. Lali and Gita, Gita and Lali, Romeo and Juliet. I mean, come on, who's got the better story? You know who has. When I first met Lali, and this is going to be answering some of the questions that have come to me from Leora, who wanted to know, I'm just glancing to my right here because I've got some pages up to, to, um, to read to you. Uh, what moments when I was talking to Lali did his eyes light up the most? Well, that one's pretty obvious actually. It was of course when he was talking about Gita. Not necessarily their time in uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau, but their time together after they escaped and how they lived in Australia. You know what he was most proud of? Well, proud not really popped up the right word, but he loved to tell me how living in Melbourne, he would take her every year up to a place north of Melbourne, quite a lot north, called the Gold Coast in, in Australia. And there they had their January summer holiday. And he used to tell me over and over how Gita was the most beautiful girl on the beach every day and how he would just look at her and look at everyone else looking at her because she was so stunningly beautiful. Yeah, we, we know she was stunningly beautiful from photos that we have, but it was her inner beauty actually that Lully was talking about. It radiated out of her. And he was able to not only capture that in talking to me, but to be able to relay that to me in such a way that I was able to write Gita's story into his. And, and that's a pretty impressive thing for a man to do, be able to tell another woman about this woman he loved so much. I take my inspiration from him, of course, and Gita and every survivor who I've met. If you look over my shoulder, you'll see somebody else I take my inspiration from. There's a photo up there. It's the black American athlete, Jesse Owens, as he's starting, I think, the 100 meter event in the 1936 Olympic Games in Berlin. Yeah, there he was, shoving it up to Hitler and saying, here I am. What a man, what an inspiration. The photo next to it, only a few people might relate to that. It's actually a photo of the uh, New Zealand All Blacks. They're called the Invincibles, this particular group. You've got to get your inspiration where you can, can't you? And so for me, I've always been a fan of athletics. And that's where I've always found a lot of my inspiration. But I will not, and I do not call these people, eh, except for maybe Jesse, heroes. The people who are heroes are those unsung, those people, those ordinary people who were living ordinary lives, who then found themselves in extraordinary circumstances and what they did to survive. They are the heroes. And now we have a whole new bunch of heroes, except I've always known that these people were heroes. And that is the people working in the medical field right now in every country in the world, doing what they can to make sure that we can have a safe life, saving those they can, comforting and supporting those they can't. I worked in that environment for 20 years, so I have always known who the heroes in our community are. And I'm not just talking about the, the doctors and the nurses and all mm -hmm. the allied health people. 
who work there in the hospital. But you know what? Why don't we think about all the other people who make a hospital tick over? I'm talking about the cleaners and the cooks. You take somebody in a, an environment, an infectious environment, who is it who then makes that environment safe for the next patient to enter? It is the cleaners. Those are also the unsung heroes that we should be acknowledging right now. And the people that are providing the food. And I'm always going to give a shout out to the social work, to people who work in any aspect of social work. They are there making a difference. Trust me, I've seen it so many times. Let's cycle back to Lali, shall we? You know, Lali told me about Silka. And Silka, her story has now been published as Silka's Journey. This was a story I had to tell because Lali made me promise. When you finish telling my story, you tell Silka's, he would say, over and over. To him, she was the bravest person and he'd wag his finger at me and say, not the bravest girl, the bravest person he ever met. Well, how lucky was I to not only get her story from Lali, but to be able to hear it from Gita's own mouth too, from a videotape. And then to be able to hear from other survivors who remembered her. Silka's journey, it follows on from Lali's story. But Lali is a man, what I loved most about him was how he embraced everybody. He was one of those men that both men and women gravitated to, wanted to be with, wanted to share their time with him. And I don't think there's a woman he ever met that he didn't immediately engage with. Yeah, he was a flirt. Come on, I'm saying it. From my 18-year-old daughter to the 90-year-old ladies that he would meet when we would socialise. He flirted with them all. He loved them all. He paid them such undying attention. And when you talk to Lully, and you managed to get him to shut up long enough to actually listen to you, but that was always something that could be a challenge because he did like to talk but you always knew he was listening to you. He heard what you were saying. And sometimes he just rolled his eyes at me as if to say, me, I don't really agree with you. But then he always would giggle, do a little dance and then come back to Lully, of course. Why shouldn't he? Why wouldn't he? He truly was an amazing man, had an amazing story to tell. And I got to tell it. I'm kind of waffling a bit here, I know that, but hey, this is the first one of these I've done. You put me on a stage in front of a, you know, 500 people and I'm fine. So let's get back to some of these questions because I would like to answer them for Leora. What part of uh, Lottie's stories was the hardest for him to tell? There were two parts of his story which he struggled to talk about. They were so painful. And funnily enough, they don't, uh, or aren't about him, and they don't include Gita. They were talking about his time living in the camp with the Roma people, gypsy people he called them, the politically correct word of course is Roma. How he connected with a group, a culture of people who he had had no connection with other than to avoid in his past life. And now he got to learn that they were just like him. Funny that, isn't it? Why is it we think that because somebody comes from a different country, uh, wears different clothing, speaks a different language, that they're not the same as us. Lolly learned that lesson and he learned it. And his words to me were, I knew that deep down we were all the same because when we got shot, not if, but when we got shot, we all bled the same color red. Yeah. That was a part of his story that he struggled to talk about because there he was living not only with men, but women, young and old, grandparents and children. The children, the only children that were in that particular part of Birkenau. There was this one, the, the camp for the, the Roma people. So that was extremely painful for him to talk about. His reaction, the second thing he had difficulty talking about, but did eventually was of course talking about uh, the angel of death, Mingale. He would talk about him and 
break down and I'd stop him and come back to it. But he had to get it out. He got out the horror and the evil that he witnessed and experienced with that man. I, he wore a white coat, but I will not um, give him any kind of title. He's not entitled to it. Talking about him would break Lully. And so I never put much about him in Lully's story because I did not want to make Lully's story about him. And there's enough academics and historians. You know the story of Mengele. So let's just move on. Just to answer your question, Leora, those were the two parts. You want to know the part that I had difficulty with? both writing, hearing, and even now still reading all these years after, was when Lully one day broke down and told me the story of finding his sister Goldie alive. It just gives me chills today. It's a small little story in his story and in, in the book. It's a passing story, but for me it was so profoundly emotional and I guess I carry that because when I think of it I'm back in that apartment I'm back in that lounge room I'm back there and Lully's sitting three feet from me and I'm seeing him become emotionally distraught at not only finding his sister alive that was the happy part but obviously see learning that his whole other family had been taken away and the realization that he would never see them again and of course he didn't. So those are the parts of his story which are incredibly emotionally affecting for him and me for different reasons. Um, why did he make use of this? Why did I make use of my particular style of writing? Um, I'm going to hope that none of my publishers are tuned in and are, are hearing this. It was simply because I actually didn't know how to write a book. Uh, I'd never written a book before. And I'm so, so, so grateful that my publishers, after receiving a couple of drafts from me, trying to write it as a memoir and trying to write it all in the third person and not doing a very good job, who they just said to me, look, we you write your story? You tell it the way you want it told. And they gave me that freedom to write the way I did. As I said, I didn't know how to write a story or write a book. All I could do was tell you in Lully's words what I had heard and hoped that it worked. It seems that it did work because uh, a few of you have bought it. All right, did Lully ever tell you how he managed to stay hopeful in such a hostile place? Do I think this was down to his personality? Uh, absolutely, to answer the second part. He was a man, and uh, if you haven't heard me talk before, then you don't know that Lully had confessed to me that Prior to being taken into Auschwitz, he had been a playboy, a love him and leave him type of character. Many, many girlfriends he told me he had. Well, doesn't that make it all the more incredible that this playboy, this man about town, could hold the arm of a young girl dressed in rags and her head shaven, and still 60 years later, with a quivering voice and shaking hands, Tell me he knew in that second he could never love another. So yes, he had that personality of being, you know, a bit of a lad about town. He was an extreme opportunist. Now today, that might not be a good thing. He was. He told me he never took a step anywhere without first looking around him. Always look for where the danger is. And so he saw opportunities and he took them. He was alert to where he was at all times except, of course, when he had typhoid, uh, and aware of everything. You know, many of survivors who I've spoken to, they all describe their surviving and how they, how they managed and got through that time in Auschwitz-Birkenau or a couple of other camps they were in. Many of them said, I was just a zombie. I just existed. Others, like Lully and, and another particular lady who has uh, become very dear to me, they were observant. They watched what was going on. They took in everything that was going on. Now, they both survived, whether you were a zombie or you were, like Lully and uh, this other lady. But with Lully, no, definitely, he came with the personality. He came with that notion of, I need to survive this. I have got to get out of here. 
and tell the world about this place. And of course, I need to get out of here and have my life with Gita. That's what he was all about, having his life with Gita. Now, I've been sort of chatting on here for about the last 20 minutes. I'm not sure that I've answered many questions or enlightened you um, any further. There is, of course, three years of my life with Lali that I could talk about. I chose to talk about his hometown of Krumpaki. Maybe next Monday night when I tune in, I'll talk to you a little bit more about him and I and our time here in Melbourne during those three years. Let me just finish by saying that I was with Lully a matter of hours before he died in the hospital room, just him and I. And the last thing I said to him when I said to him, you go and be with Gita, it's time. Because I knew he wasn't going to see the sun come up the next day. But the last thing I said to him was, I will never ever stop trying to tell your story. Well, I've told it in the written format, and now I'm privileged to be able to travel. Well, when Qantas are flying again next, I will. But now I can sit and talk to you in the comfort of my own home, and I will never ever stop talking about Lali Sokolov, Gita Sokolov, Silke Klein, Cecilia Kovakova. And in a few months' time, you will start hearing not only about the, the People in My Stories of Hope book, but in the book that will be following that, because yes, that one's, uh, it's lined up too. And um, I'll see if I can get permission from, from my publishers who are not watching this and who I will now have to email uh, how much I can share with you in the next week or two about the story that will follow Stories of Hope. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm not sure what the appropriate phrase is for talking to you down the medium of Facebook. I'm going to let you go. I'm going to come back, same time, same place, same bat channel next Monday night. And uh, let's talk a little bit about Silka, a little bit more about Lali. And I'll find out what else I can talk to you about. But I do want to remind you, if you want to, and you've got the chance, go to Your Stories of Hope. And there you will hear about my next book and what you have done for me. You. You've done this for me. You've given me this life. And I am so, so grateful. And I thank you. I thank you one and all. Or as we would say in Slovakia, Jacquiem. Jacquiem. Good night. Good morning. Good afternoon, wherever you are. I'll see you same time next week. Bye-bye.